Thank you for joining us in worship today on this third Sunday in 2022. It's uh, January the 16th, and we're glad that you have joined us in worship. Our church board decided to have at least one more service uh, that's virtual, and so we're glad that you can join us for this virtual service. Let's begin our service by singing the chorus, The Family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I have been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this song. We appreciate the opportunity to worship together with you. Uh, I know that there are several that have uh, expressed joy in being able to see the service earlier in the morning, so we're glad that you're together with us today. Um, our opening scripture is taken from John chapter 14, verse 19, where the Lord Jesus says this, A little while longer, and the world will see me no longer. But you will see me, because I live you will live also. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray that your spirit would come and minister to us through your word today. And we pray that as we enter into the adoration of the Almighty, that our worship would be in spirit and in truth. So bless our time together now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our responsive reading is taken from Psalm 84, Psalm 84. If you have your uh, email, you can see the actual text there. I will uh, be reciting the part that's bold print and you can respond together in the fine print. Psalm 84. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They, they go, go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. God bless the reading of his word. The first of our hymns is number 21 in your hymnal, if you have it. The song is entitled, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Yeah. 
appreciate your joyful singing with us. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Uh, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 57. We're going to read a well-known passage here about resurrection. Uh, today I'd like to talk on a topic. It's not really a, uh, a, a, a sermon that's based on a, a, an exegesis of a text. It's really kind of a topical message, and it's about death. That death is the reality we all must face. One of the things that happens at the end of every year, and many times even more than one time a year, is you'll see news organizations, um, and they will reflect on the people that we've lost in the last year. Now, if you've noticed, especially right at the end of this last year, uh, one of the famous people that we lost was Betty White. And everyone was decrying, or decrying the fact that she was less than three weeks away from hitting the century mark. So she was 99 years, almost 100 years old when she died. Well, if we are honest about our lives, there's more than just the famous people that we've lost, especially in 2021 and 2020 with COVID and all the other things going on. Uh, there have been many uh, people that we have loved that we have lost. And sometimes it's very difficult for us to deal with the loss of that loved one. And uh, so I'd like to speak today on death, the reality we all must face. So let's turn then, if you have your Bibles, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 57. The Apostle Paul is writing about resurrection here, and here's what he said. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up, in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word, and we pray your blessing over your word as we read it. Strengthen us now by your spirit to hear from you and to know what you have to say to us regarding this thing that we all experience called death. Thank you now, Lord. Help my words, the words of my mouth, and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now this message is meant for a broad audience, but specifically the, the people that I serve live in Tamiami Village for the most part. And if you live in Tamiami Village, I have kind of a, a, little, uh, uh, a little story to tell. And that is, there's a place in Los Angeles that's kind of famous for its, for its businesses and for its, uh, uh, some of the shops that are there. And even there are some clubs that are there. And it's on Sunset Boulevard. It's in Hollywood, Florida. And a little portion of it is they call it the Sunset Strip. And I think it was named because someone one day as they walked down, they saw the beautiful sunset that comes off um, the ocean there, the Pacific Ocean in the Los Angeles area. So it's Sunset Strip. Well, can I suggest that living in Tamiami Village is synonymous with living on Sunset Strip? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that Sunset Strip was named because there was a sunset uh, on the Pacific Ocean that caused someone to love the scene. But a sunset is the time of day when the sun is going down. It is retiring. And in your lives, because of your experience, uh, you are in the sunset years of your life. And so, in essence, you're living on Sunset Strip. What does that also mean? That also means that the reality of our life being over, our physical life being over on this earth, is closer 
to its actual fruition. So we must all face our own mortality. And we also experience the death of many loved ones all around us. And so this is really a reality that we all must face. So let's, let's talk a little bit about death then. Where does death come from? Well, when God created the world in the book of Genesis, God created the world in a perfect place. We had Adam and Eve there and they were in the garden and they were living uh, a perfect life. But the Bible says in chapter three, actually in chapter two, the Lord gave a warning to Adam and then Eve heard it from Adam probably. And that was the Lord said to Adam and the Lord, this is a uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Now Adam didn't understand what that meant. He just heard the command of God that there was one basically prohibition for him, and that was they could eat of every tree, even the tree of life, but they couldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what happens? You know the story. In chapter 3, just the next chapter uh, after God telling this to Adam, uh, Eve and Adam partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes are opened. Uh, they know they're naked, and they hide themselves from God. Now, we've talked about that's another whole thing. But what happened the day they ate of that tree? Well, God had promised to Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so Adam and Eve died. Now, they didn't die physically right away, but they certainly died spiritually. And then the process of death began in their mortal bodies so that they lived and then died. Adam lived, I think, 930 years. We don't know how long Eve lived, but probably similar in years to him. But there was a time when the end of their physical life came. Now, as we go into the book of Romans, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is making a point about um, the first Adam and the second Adam, uh, the one who was disobedient and the one who was obedient. And he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death, death spread to all men, because all sin. And that, that's the one verse. He goes on to say more. But in verse 12, he said, Sin came into the world through one man, that is Adam, and death through sin. So what happened was that death is a result of the sin of mankind. Now, by the way, this is just a little aside here. If you study uh, the origin of all things, um, many people believe that there were animals and you know prehistoric animals before mankind ever existed. Well, there would have had to have been life and death, and those all died, and then Adam came out of that. Well, that would be against the very thesis of Paul's statement here in Romans 5. This is Paul's systematic theology. It's his treatise about God providing for us a savior in Jesus Christ. And his premise is this, that death came because of sin, that Adam's sin brought about death. And so uh, what we understand is uh, Paul's treatise would be considered uh, null and void if there was death before Adam. No, there wasn't death before Adam. Adam was the cause of death, Adam and Eve. It says, therefore, as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men. So we experience death, my friends, because of our forefather and foremother, uh, our original parents, Adam and Eve. So what that means is this, all of us have the sentence of death on our lives. All of us have the sentence of death on our lives. And secondly, none of us knows our days. There is no guarantee as to how many years you can live. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 90 says this, Psalm 90 verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for soon it is cut off and we fly away. 
the psalmist is recognizing that at that time, the, after the flood, the length of mankind's life had severely shortened, and now the length of our years is 70, and if by strength, potentially 80 years. That's what God's telling us, that 70 or 80 years is about all we get. So if you get, actually, if, and if you're one of those people in the park here who are 80 plus years old, then you've gotten added years compared to what God even says in his word. So none of us knows our days. We don't know. Our life may only be a few years. Our life may be 80 years. We're not sure. The problem many times comes in our hearts when someone who is younger dies. In fact, there are numerous times when I've been at funerals and have actually performed funerals for younger children. And the amount of people that come to those types of funerals is usually much greater than some funeral of an older person because it's so unusual. We think it's like not fair that God had allowed a young child or a younger person to die. But again, God doesn't guarantee us anything. God knows the, the scope of our years and our days. In fact, it says in Psalm 139 that God knows the days that were ordained for us when as yet there was none of them. And so God knows how many days we have. We don't know. And so uh, each of us then is given today. Each of us is given today. In fact, in verse 12 of Psalm 90, uh, the psalmist says this, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That we ought to live our lives knowing that we have today. Today. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, Today is the accepted time, or now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. So we have today, and we need to live our lives today because this is the only day that we're given. Uh, it also says in Psalm 103, listen, listen to how the Lord deals with his children. It says, as a, saw, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. And so we don't know about our days. In fact, the scripture describes our days as dust, as a vapor in other places, the scripture says. We just don't know our days. And so how does God deal with us as human beings, knowing that our lives are uh, but a short amount of time. How does he deal with us in the context of death? Well, first of all, again, as I said before, all of us must face our own mortality. And so what do we do in regards to the reality that you and I are going to die? None of us are going to get out of here alive. Well, God ministers to us first of all and foremost through the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. God ministers to us through the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Why did God send his son? Jesus Christ was sent to the earth to save his people from their sins. Remember, we quoted that verse before, especially at Christmas time. Matthew 1, 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ came to take on our sin and to take the penalty of our sin, that is death, in order that we might have an opportunity for eternal life. I had mentioned earlier that God had said to Ab uh, Adam and Eve that in the day they ate of that tree, they would die. And they did die spiritually. And so they needed to be reborn spiritually in order to have life with God. And then the physical body would experience death. Um, Jesus Christ has died for our sin in order that we might have life. Romans chapter 6, verse 30, uh, 23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have the promise of transformed bodies because Christ has won the victory over death. 
We're going to get to that in a moment. Uh, I, I, I think the passage of Scripture that we read as our actual text of Scripture tells the story of what God is going to do with our mortal bodies. In the text that I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption, uh, corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus Christ has won the victory through his death, by dying for our sins, and through rising from the dead and having victory over the grave. Now let me summarize it for you individually uh, with this particular statement. And, and this isn't original with me, but I've said it before and maybe you've heard it before. It goes like this. If you're only born once, you're going to die twice. But if you're born twice, then you'll die only once. Now let me explain. And that is this. All of us have been born physically. All of us have been born physically. But we have the sentence of death on our lives. And if we never are born a second time, Jesus describes in John 3 to be born again or born from above or born anew. If you're not born again a second time, then you'll not only die physically, but then you'll also face judgment after this life. And that judgment is described as the second death. So if you're only born once, You'll live a life here on earth, and then you'll die once, and then you'll experience the judgment of God and experience a second death. But the good news is this. If you're born twice, then you'll die only once. That is, if you're born physically like all of us are, but then if you're born spiritually by being born again in your spirit and your heart and soul, then you enter into a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we, you will die physically. That's the one death you'll experience. But what will be after that, this life? Then it will be a life of eternal joy. In fact, it's eternal life with God forever in his presence in heaven. So once again, it's this way. If you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll die only once. So God ministers to us in our own mortality by giving us the hope of resurrection after this life, that there's more to this life than living and dying. There's an opportunity to know that we have eternity with God forever. All right, the second thing is how does God minister to us when we deal with the death of others? Because before we die ourselves physically, we're going to experience the loss of a loved one on this side of eternity. There's someone in our family. There's someone we've known as a friend. Uh, there's a, a relative of ours that dies. Uh, in my own family, uh, my oldest sister lost her son, Eric, when he was about three and a half to four and a half years old. Um, he started having cancer and then he died. He died of neuroblast, or he died of cancer and the complications around cancer. And then less than 10 years later, my youngest sister, Lois, uh, lost her son. And Joseph died about the same age, about four and a half years old. Now, it was a great loss for both of them. But the hope of the resurrection for both of them gives us the opportunity to have hope in the midst of our sorrow. So God brings us hope in the midst of our sorrow, but there's even greater part to this, that God comes to us in our grief and our sorrow, and he ministers to our heart by his own presence. One of the passages of scripture that has always been a blessing to me when I consider 
when someone is going through the loss of a loved one is what the writer Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 when he's describing the suffering servant. And the suffering servant is the Lord Jesus Christ. Where it says of Jesus that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, I think that the writer Isaiah is prophesying. He doesn't always know what, what he sees, but he's prophesying about what Jesus is going to experience himself. That Jesus, because he has come to be our savior, that he is the one who is going to die as a sacrifice for our sins, that in his own suffering, he is going to be a man of sorrow. He's going to experience the sorrows of death himself. And he's going to be acquainted with grief. If you examine the passion texts in each of the gospels, and you see the Lord Jesus going through the agony, first of being betrayed by one of his own disciples, and then basically uh, all the other disciples deserted him. And him being there and praying in the garden before the father asking, Lord, if you be your will, you could take this cup from me. The Bible says he sweat drops of blood. He was so in agony. And then all the time through the cross, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knows grief. And so if you are one that has lost a loved one, and which one of us hasn't lost a loved one? Know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who can come alongside you and the Holy Spirit in the same way. Come alongside you and he knows your sorrow and your grief because he's acquainted with grief. Now the second great passage that brings comfort to me is in 2 Corinthians. It's in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. I'm going to re actually read it. 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul says this, blessed, this is in verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Sorry, the God of all comfort. That the Apostle Paul, when he describes God in this particular text, he calls him the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That God is described as a God of comfort. And not just some comfort, but all comfort. And then Paul goes on to say this, Who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, that God is a God of comfort and that when we go through sorrow and suffering and grief and pain, that God comes alongside of us as the God of comfort and he comforts us. Now, he doesn't do it just so we can receive that comfort, but he comforts us so that sometime later we can minister to others as well. Earlier in my message, I mentioned about my two sisters, and, and I, I, I'm thinking about this, that who was better to comfort my youngest sister, Lois, about the loss of her son than my older sister, Priscilla, who herself had gone through the same suffering about 10 years before? Who could do it? God comforts us so that we could comfort others. And so here we have the Lord Jesus Christ as, as the one who is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And God, who by the Apostle Paul is described as the God of comfort, he ministers to our hearts. And so I, I can't help but think of people that are in the midst of the loss of a loved one. Their loved one has just died and, and they're working through the grief. And then we have a memorial service. And we wonder, how can they make it through? The way they make it through is because God is there alongside them. He is right beside them.
I can't help but think of uh, the family of Pastor Lloyd Patterson. Thank you for his many years of ministry to our congregation. And there's going to be a memorial service for him on the 29th of this month. And God will be there. God will be there, Lord Jesus, the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. God, the God of comfort, will be there for all the children of the Pattersons. And for all of us who love Pastor Lloyd, God will minister to our hearts. And God will be there for you when you experience pain and sorrow and suffering and grief. So my friends, what do we see here? We see God who knows our days. He knows that we are but dust. He recognizes that our lives are a, a, are a short breath. They're like the grass that grows and then uh, it fades away. The Bible says, and the, and the earth even doesn't remember it anymore, that God comes alongside of us in the midst of our experiencing death and he ministers to our hearts. So, for those of you living on Sunset Strip, and in all honesty, all of us are kind of living on Sunset Strip, Sunset Strip no matter what age we are, because we're all awaiting our physical death. Let's find hope and encouragement and promise in what God has told us is going to happen after us. The verse that I read as a call to worship said, Jesus said, because I live, you also shall live. Jesus Christ lives. He is risen from the dead. And because he is risen from the dead, my hope, my hope is that I too shall live like he lives. Now, I'm going to face death one day. I don't know what day that's going to be. And so will you. But on that day when we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ and been born a second time, we have the hope of eternal life after this life is over. What a joy that is. And then secondly, for those of us who are sorrowing over a loved one who has gone before us, Know that God is the one who comforts us in our afflictions. Know that God is the one who knows our grief and sorrow. And let him minister his love and grace and comfort and peace to you in the midst of what you face. God bless you as you lean into God and recognize that he knows all about our life and he knows all about our death and all the things we experience. And he is there waiting to minister to our lives. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, today, as we think about death and the reality that we mu must all face, we pray, Lord God, that you would help us, first of all, to know for certain that we are ready to meet you after this life is over. Lord, that all of us would have been born twice. That we have come to know you as Savior and Lord by entering into relationship through Jesus Christ and believing on him. And Lord, for those of us who are still, maybe even today, uh, sorrowing over the loss of a loved one, we pray, Lord God, that you would come alongside them and minister to their heart and their life. Thank you, Lord. We love you today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to make just a couple of announcements, and then we're going to have some time uh, for prayer. Um, just two announcements. I mentioned in the, in the message that there is going to be a memorial service for Pastor Patterson. And that is going to take place on Saturday, January 29th at 1 p.m. at North Shore Alliance Church in North Fort Myers. I think many of you know that Pastor Lloyd was uh, ordained in the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, and that's the Christian Missionary Alliance Church here in town. And that's where that 
memorial service will be. The second uh, item that I'd like to announce is to remind you of our potluck, which will be taking place on February 20th from 1 to 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m. And we're going to have some more information. Uh, you, if you were able to contact uh, Sharon Gruff and let her know of your interest in being a part of that, and we'll, we will be uh, interacting with you, and we hope that you'll be a part of that fellowship on the 20th of February. All right. Uh, just want to express my appreciation for those of you who have been praying for us. We have experienced COVID here in our own home. My wife and Stephen got it last week and then, um, well, a week and a half ago. And uh, I actually came down with a case probably on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, and I'm on the mend right now. I'm actually taping this on Saturday and feeling much better. And so uh, we'll be in touch with you as to uh, being together with you again. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you again for your prayers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you in Jesus' name and we pray today that we can uh, know your peace that passes understanding. We pray that we may know your comfort that comes from you, the God of comfort. We pray, Lord, because you are a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that you would minister to our hearts when, we've, when we grieve over the loss of a loved one. And Lord, in regards to our own personal mortality, we pray, Lord God, that we would do business with you and be sure that we are born again. Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And so I pray that that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That all of us in the hearing of my voice might, might understand their need to be born again and ask Jesus into their heart and experience the joy and the promise of eternal life. Lord God, I would pray today for uh, those in authority over us. I would pray for President Biden, the Supreme Court, and the Congress. I would pray today for our missionaries, for the Caleros. Thank you for Carlos and Lillian, and for Emma. And we pray for Lillian as she is carrying their second child as well. Bless her as she is expecting in May. Strengthen her and strengthen that child. May that child be a godly seed and a healthy child. Lord, for those in our midst who have lost loved ones, I want to pray for uh, the Don Drugan family, for Dave and Joyce Wells and, and all their family. Pray for uh, the, the relatives of, and friends of Harry Williams. Pray for the family of uh, Lloyd Patterson. Pray for the family of Leon Taylor. And pray for the Sorellis as they lost their granddaughter, Britley. Lord, those are some of the sorrows that we feel, but you are the one who ministers to them, and I pray that you would do that. Lord, I would pray today for those who are fighting cancer. I think of Margie Lintz today, and for David Folkstead, for Diane Sopa, for Nyla Joe Bray. Lord, minister to their hearts and lives. Father, I would pray today for Elaine Longjohn as she continues to recover from her stroke. Bless her, Lord. Thank you for Michael Russell. Continue to strengthen him, God. Thank you for the good report we have heard about him. Lord God, I would pray for my mother-in-law, Esther Hoffner, as she's uh, preparing to have a procedure done. Bless her and strengthen her. Uh, I pray for uh, Fran Bordeaux's nephew, Kevin. Bless him, God. Uh, we pray for the Vesters today, for all the needs in their family as they're moving. Lord, we pray for Jim and the strength for each day. We pray for Jimmy Vester, who needs to gain weight. We think of uh, Sharon's sister, Mary, who is, has multiple health issues. For Weston White, for Mary Croom, for Case and Davis, we pray for those requests as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you. I thank you for the prayers that have gone up, gone up on behalf of my own family. And I pray for my wife and Stephen and, and even for myself uh, that you would continue to strengthen us. And we pray you keep the rest of our children from getting COVID as well. Thank you, Lord. We know that you love us and we do pray these things knowing that an answer will come and you will minister to our lives and you will answer uh, in, a, in a way that's exceedingly beyond what we could even ask or think. So bless us and strengthen us today, O oh God. 
We love you and, and praise you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll continue our singing by turning to number 439 in your hymnal. The song is entitled, Jesus Shall Reign. final song is number 348. It's really a prayer. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Appreciate your participation 
in singing those songs of worship and prayer to God. Uh, receive the benediction, and then we'll sing the doxology. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. I hope you enjoyed today's service. I would like to announce that the 2021 financial report is available. For those of you who would like a copy, drop me an email or my contact information is printed on the cover of our weekly bulletin we receive at church. So thank you for watching today. God bless you.